Hi, welcome to the RCNA Radio Graphics Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Lily Wang. I'm an associate professor and neuroradiologist at the University of Cincinnati. Today, we're going to focus on differentiated thyroid cancer, or DTC, which is the most common type of thyroid cancer. Specifically, we'll be diving into what happens after surgery and how to manage recurrence. Today, our podcast is based on the Radiographics Head and Neck Special Monograph for October. The article is titled Differentiated Thyroid Cancer After Thyroidectomy by Dr. Wei Ming Chua and colleagues from Singapore. This article provides a comprehensive overview of the role radiologists and imaging play in managing DTC patients after surgery. Let's get started. Differentiated thyroid cancer, or DTC, makes up over 90% of thyroid cancer cases. These include papillary and follicular thyroid cancers. Surgery is the most common treatment. For many patients, surgery can be curative, but about 23% of patients will experience a recurrence, making it critical to stay vigilant with follow-up care. Most DTCs have an excellent prognosis with a 10-year survival rate greater than 95%. However, approximately 23.5% of patients develop disease recurrence during their lifetime, with about a third of the subset of patients developing distant metastases. What is the primary management of DTC? Surgery is a definite treatment of thyroid cancer. All patients with suspected or cytologically confirmed thyroid malignancy should undergo initial preoperative imaging with ultrasound to evaluate the tumor size and identify cervical lymph node involvement. Cross-sectional imaging is reserved for T3 or T4 tumors or apparent extensive nodal involvement. Surgery can be either a lobectomy or thyroid total thyroidectomy. Total thyroidectomy is recommended for tumors larger than 4 cm or with gross extrathyroid or extension because radioactive iodine treatment is usually advocated for clinically evident nodal disease. Total thyroidectomy is also typically performed in such cases. Neck dissection is an integral part of surgical treatment for patients with nodal disease, because thyroid cancer follows a predictable lymphatic drainage pattern. Selective neck dissection is the most frequently used and recommended approach to avoid surgical mobility and a more, often more extensive surgery. How do we stage DTC postoperatively? The most widely used staging system is the T and M staging system. This was developed by the American Joint Commission on Cancer. This system aids in prognostication and prediction of cancer-related mortality risk. Although the staging process is done preoperatively, postoperative Histopathologic staging remains the most accurate method to assess the local tumor extent and lymph node involvement. Assessment of metastatic disease is also usually conducted postoperatively with imaging and is often performed using I131 whole body scintigraphy as part of radioactive iodine ser- therapy. How is the postoperative risk stratified for risk recurrence? Unlike other cancers, the risk of disease recurrence in patients with DTC does not always correlate with mortality risk. A large cohort study reported that about a third of patients with DTC develop tumor recurrence over a period of 30 years. Approximately two-thirds of patients with recurrent disease were subsequently cured, while only 15% patients with recurrent disease died. The 2015 American Thyroid Association, or ATA, risk stratification system is well established. Although recurrence risk is best viewed as a continuum, it can be broadly divided into low, intermediate, and high-risk categories based on histological subtype, mutational status, completeness of resection, extrathyroidal extension, vascular invasion, regional lymph node involvement, and distant metastasis. Radioactive iodine 131 therapy is given to selected patients within a few months after total thyroidectomy, guided by their ATA risk stratification. Depending on the risk of stratification status, there are three main objectives to radioactive iodine therapy. It can ablate remnant disease, provide adjuvant treatment, and treat known disease.
How do we monitor response to therapy? Because the risk of disease recurrence and mortality is subject to change over time based on responses, it's essential to conduct dynamic risk assessment for patients after initial treatment and during follow-up. This dynamic evaluation is key in both prognostication and treatment of patients. Patients can be reclassified according to their response to therapy as having an excellent, indeterminate, biochemically incomplete, or structurally incomplete response. How do we image these patients postoperatively? Well, the frequency of postoperative surveillance depends on their initial ATA restratification, subsequent treatment response, and any imaging or biochemical abnormalities identified during follow-up. Given that the majority of tumor recurrence occurs in the thyroid bed and cervical lymph nodes, ultrasound is the first-line imaging. Ultrasound has high spatial resolution for superficial structures and is therefore well suited for the evaluation of the postoperative neck. You can also consider other imaging modalities, include in radio iodine imaging (CT, MRI, and). Foreign 18 FDG PET CT, particularly in patients with increasing biochemical marker levels and negative ultrasound findings. Radio iodine imaging is primarily performed as part of the initial radioactive iodine therapy after thyroidectomy, and it is used for initial staging to detect persistent disease or distant mats. During follow-up, radio iodine imaging is typically reserved for patients at intermediate to high risk of recurrence. Or those who undergo post-empiric radioactive iodine therapy in the context of biochemically incomplete response with increasing biochemical marker levels. CT and MRI are useful in the evaluation of sites that are not well assessed with the ultrasound, such as the retropharyngeal region and the superior media sinus, and in detection of distant mats. MRI offers an advantage over CT because non-iodinated contrast media are used, which means there is no interference with radioactive iodine uptake and enables the prompt administration of radioactive iodine treatment. FDG PET is most useful in patients with increasing biochemical marker levels and negative radioiodine imaging. What does the neck look like after surgery? The normal postoperative thyroid bed appears as a small area of fibro fatty tissue with the surrounding structures like the strap muscles, carotid sheath, and the cervical esophagus displaced towards the thyroid bed. Previous selective neck dissection results in a paucity of fat around the carotid sheath and beneath the sternocleidomastoid muscle. On radioiodine images, remnant thyroid tissue can have radioiodine uptake. So with that in mind, what does recurrence look like? Early recurrent disease most frequently occur local regionally, comprising about 79% of all recurrences. Of these, most recurrences are nodal, 20% in the thyroid bed, 6% in the trachea or adjacent muscles, and approximately 7.5% of patients develop distant meds during follow-up most commonly affecting the lungs and bones. Usually ultrasound is performed at 6-12 months after surgery and subsequently at periodic intervals, depending on the patient's risk status and thyroglobulin level measurements. Ultrasound within the first three months after surgery is not recommended because of the resolving postoperative inflammatory changes, and recurrent thyroid bed nodule looks just like preoperative imaging findings. So the cervical lymph node mats have a rounded shape with loss of fatty hilum, peripheral vascularity, and hyperechogenicity. Both microcalx and cystic changes are highly specific for nodal mats. You can also have benign nodules in the thyroid bed after total thyroidectomy, including postoperative scar tissue, suture granulomas, and remnant thyroid tissue. Postoperative scarring or fibrosis may appear as coarse heterogeneous echo texture and alternating band-like areas that mimic nodules on certain views but blend into the surrounding tissues during real-time exam. A common challenge during ultrasound surveillance of most thyroidectomy patients is differentiating local recurrence from benign nodules of the thyroid bed. Benign lesions of the thyroid bed is generally similar on follow-up or they can decrease in size. 
you may need to do serial imaging and correlate with thyroglobulin levels or even tissue sampling to tell them apart. When should you consider a CT or MRI in addition to ultrasound? Well, in patients with bulky disease or aerodigestive tract involvement, CT and MRI could be very helpful. And in patients with rising serum seroglobulin and negative ultrasound findings, you should consider CT and MRI. So retropharyngeal and mediastinal regions can be assessed. Retropharyngeal lymph node or metastases are rare during the initial presentation of DTC, but patients with recurrent or persistent disease often have retropharyngeal nodal involvement. On CT and MRI, if you have local regional recurrence, they can appear as local invasion of adjacent structures, calcification, cystic change, hyperattenuation on CT, and hyperintensity on T1 because there's thyroglobulin deposit or hemorrhagic material. And um, they often have intense or heterogeneous enhancement. Lymph node metastases may display a round shape with loss of fatty hilum. The presence of microcalcification and cystic changes have a high specificity on CT. Internal cystic change and signal hyperintensity are useful signs to identify lymph node mets on T1 weighted imaging on MR. And of course, CT and MR are really useful for distant mets like bone and lungs. Compared with MR, CT has a lower sensitivity and lower specificity for detecting bone mats, but it's commonly performed in patients with increasing biochemical marker levels and normal ultrasound findings because it's widely available and you can assess uh, other organs in the same setting quite easily. Usually, CT and MRs are done with intravenous contrast because it just makes everything easier to see. Uh, except in the circumstances for lung mets, you want to do a non-contrast CT. And um, because iodine contrast can selectively compete with I131, so you don't want to give it if the patients are planned to have radio iodine therapy. Radio iodine treatment would have to be delayed by four to six weeks if the patient received contrast for CT. Now let's talk about radio iodine imaging. So the isotopes of iodine are selectively concentrated in thyroid follicular cells by means of a sodium iodine transporter. It allows us to image both benign remnant and malignant thyroid tissues. I1 to 3 is a pure gamma emitter and I131 emits beta and gamma photons. In particular, I131 is very useful because it has both therapeutic and diagnostic abilities, so you can treat and stage disease at the same time. But the limitations are these don't have the anatomic details for accurate disease classification or localization. So often a spec is done with a CT to help with localization. So on radio iodine imaging, persistent or recurrent disease look like abnormal radio iodine accumulation. Local regional disease usually looks focal or multifocal retention in the neck. Um, this can be confounded if you have remnant thyroid tissue after surgery, so um, you should compare with a prior. Sometimes some nonspecific uptake may occur. And radio iodine imaging is very helpful for assessing distant metastases. However, a small percentage of patients can have radio iodine refractory disease. If the patient has increasing serum biochemical marker levels and negative radio iodine imaging, radioactive iodine negative disease should be suspected and this often has poor prognosis. How about FDG PET CT? So FDG is a glucose analog that acts as a surrogate marker for glucose metabolism. Although we don't usually do this as an initial part of staging, 18 fluorine FDG PET CT is very useful for evaluation of radioactive iodine refractory disease and is recommended for patients with elevated or increasing serum thyroglobulin levels but negative radio iodine imaging. You have increased uptake on FDG, then um, this is often associated with more aggressive tumors and poor prognosis. 
So how is DTC recurrence managed? Well, surgery remains the main treatment uh, if the patients can have it. So current guidelines recommend a fine needle aspiration or a biopsy for lymph nodes measuring at least 8 and 10 millimeters in the central and lateral neck respectively before surgery. In cases of local regional recurrence invading the aerodigestive tract, surgery should be combined with radioactive iodine and or external beam radiation therapy. Resection of mats is also an option for distant mats and can be performed with either a curative or palliative intent. Radioactive iodine is normally recommended as adjuvant therapy for resectable recurrent DTC. It may also be considered as first-line treatment of recurrent DTC in cases of unresectable disease or if surgery is contraindicated. Radioactive iodine therapy is particularly effective for treating pulmonary micrometastases with high rates of complete remission. External beam radiation therapy can be done for locally advanced disease. It may also be considered for surgically unresectable tumor, radioactive iodine refractory disease, or for palliation of symptoms in local, regional, or distant metastases. You can also perform percutaneous ablation. They have different forms, including chemoablation, thermal ablation. Thermal ablation can also be used to treat lung, liver, and bone metastases. In addition to these treatments, you can also consider systemic therapy. The most established systemic therapy for DTC is multi-targeted tyrosine kinase inhibitors, levanitinib and sorafenib. And they are currently used as standard first-line tr- drugs for the treatment of radioiodine refractory disease that is not amenable to other directed therapies and is metastatic, rapidly progressive, symptomatic, and or life-threatening. Because of the adverse effects of tyrosine kinase inhibitors can affect a patient's quality of life, patients should be carefully counseled before you start treatment and must be closely monitored for toxicity. In conclusion, although DTC has an excellent prognosis, some patients have recurrent disease, and radiologists play a fundamental role in the postoperative surveillance of patients with DTC. Postoperative surveillance of DTC involves the evaluation of the post-treatment clinical risk status, biochemical markers, and imaging findings. It is also very important for radiologists to have a basic understanding of the clinical risk stratification system and biochemical markers to facilitate accurate interpretation of imaging findings in the context of a patient's clinical status to optimize care. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. This is Dr. Lily Wang on your RSNA Radiographics podcast. Thanks to Dr. Cho and colleagues on this wonderful comprehensive article on differentiated thyroid cancer after treatment. Please rate, review, and subscribe to the Radiographics podcast and take a look at the article on the Radiographics website for the beautiful images and tables.